Fantastic. You are in the right place. This is the Great Books Summer Program special event. My name is Katie Lagana. I work for Great Books all year round. I will be your moderator this evening. As you likely know, Great Books Summer Program has been bringing students from across the U.S. and around the world together for discussions about the big ideas of humanity. I am delighted to bring our whole community together for this very special author chat. We're honored to have Drs. Rob Reich, Marin Sahabi, Jeremy Weinstein with us. These three Stanford professors will discuss their recently published book about a topic that touches all of our lives. Before I introduce the authors further and we dive into the worrisome wonder that is big tech and its possible, dare I say, collision course with democracy, I'd like to ask David Ward, president and co-founder of Great Books to say a few words. David. Welcome everyone. Really glad to have you here. This should be a great gathering. Um, you know, it's uh, truly intriguing and formidable subject matter. Uh, thankfully, we're in the company of formidable authors who've decided to take it on. But this, this notion of where did big tech go wrong is something that I think we all live with in the day to day. It's, it's a reality of, of life that, that, that we think about, that we see, that in, uh, in, in we have encounters with it all the time. Um, these, are, these gentlemen are especially, I think, uh, equipped and maybe uniquely so to to talk to this subject because they they live within it. These these are guys from engineering, from the humanities, from ethics, from poli from policy, um, and from Silicon Valley, from Stanford, where it all you know emanates. And uh, we are just so privileged and, and pleased to have them with us tonight for this event. Um, on a personal note, although I've just met Mehran and, and Jeremy this evening, Rob Reich and the Great Book Summer Program go back many years. Um, if you'll permit me, I'll just quickly tell the story. Now, having just heard Rob tell the story a little differently than I tell it, um, I'm going to go with my version anyway, and, and he, can, uh, he can offer footnotes or correction or whatever he might think. Um, I think it was 2004, and Great Books Summer Program was just about to start its third very successful season at Amherst College when we received an invitation from Rob Reich at Stanford to come out and see what he was doing because it was similar. It was, it was you know, the creation of, of like-minded people. Uh, he was looking at philosophy and had in the most remarkable uh, gathering invited kids from all over the West Coast, from all kinds of backgrounds, from all kinds of family economics to come and talk about philosophy for a week or two on the uh, balmy campus of, of Stanford University. It was a remarkable program and a wonderful one. And in a couple of years, his mission and our mission kind of melded together. And Rob went on to do uh, other remarkable and important things. And Great Book Summer Program at Stanford was, was born out of, out of that, uh, that initial summer. Rob was kind enough in summers to come, to come back and teach for us and to inspire students. And we think of him as our first friend at Stanford. And Marin and, and Jeremy, um, you're new friends and we, we welcome you to Great Book Summer Program. Great. Back to you. Fantastic. Thank you, David. And just a quick housekeeping note uh, for those familiar with our great books classes. This, if you, I'm sure you've noticed a difference. This is a webinar, unlike our regular programs. 
If you're not on stage here with us, you're not on camera. So sit back, enjoy, but do note that there is a Q&A section if you move your cursor. If you're on a larger screen, you'll see the little bar with the, with the chat and Q&A section. You can add your questions there as the talk progresses. We'll use the last 20 minutes or so for audience Q&A. Um, you're also very welcome to use the chat to share comments throughout. You've already probably seen Great Books Director Paula Abate manning the chat to guide, assist, chime in, and she may just reach out to you to let you know that you will be the lucky recipient of one of the 25 books that we'll be giving away tonight. So now for the main event, we are here with wonderful authors to discuss their book, System Error, Where Big Tech Went Wrong and How We Can Reboot. This book exposes the roots of our current predicament, how big tech's relentless focus on optimization reinforces discrimination, erodes privacy, displaces workers, and pollutes the information we get. This mindset prioritizes what companies care about over the values that we as a democratic society might choose to embrace. Even well-intentioned optimizers often fail at measuring what is truly meaningful. And when their creative disruptions achieve great scale, we find their agenda imposed on every part of our world. Armed with understanding of how technologists think and exercise their power, these three Stanford professors share how we can hold that power to account. Troubled by the values that permeate the university and Silicon Valley, these professors work together to chart a new path forward, creating a popular course to transform how tomorrow's technologists might better approach their profession. Now, as the dominance of big tech becomes an explosive societal conundrum, they share their provocative insights and concrete solutions to help everyone understand what's happening, what's at stake, and what we can do to control technology instead of letting it control us. So let's meet the authors. Rob Reich is a philosopher, the director of Stanford University's Center for Ethics and Society, co-director of the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society, and associate director of its new Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. He is a leading thinker at the intersection of ethics and technology, the author of Just Giving, Why Philanthropy is Failing Democracy and How It Can Do Better, a former sixth grade teacher, he has won multiple teaching awards at Stanford. He helped to create the global movement of Giving Tuesday and serves as chair of its board. And of course, is a wonderful supporter and friend of Great Books and guest faculty member. Maren Sahami was recruited to Google in its startup, by, in its startup days by Sergey Brin and is one of the inventors of email spam filtering technology. Thank you for that, Maren. With a background in machine learning and artificial intelligence, he returned to Stanford as a computer science professor in 2007 and now holds the James and Eleanor Cheeseboro Professorship in Engineering. As the Associate Chair for Education in the Computer Science Department, he helped redesign the program's undergraduate curriculum. He is one of the instructors of Stanford's massive introductory computer programming course taken by nearly 1,500 students per year. Mehran is also a limited partner in several VC funds and serves as an advisor to high-tech startups. Jeremy Weinstein, a political scientist, went to Washington with, professor, with President Obama in 2009. A key staffer in the White House, he foresaw how new technologies might remake the relationship between governments and citizens and launched Obama's Open Government Partnership. When Samantha Power was appointed US ambassador to the UN, she brought Jeremy to New York, first as her chief of staff and then as her deputy. He returned to Stanford in 2015 as a professor of political science, where he now leads Stanford Impact Labs, a major university initiative that partners research teams with leaders in the public, private, and social sectors to tackle important societal problems. He is a prize-winning author and a decorated teacher whose expertise spans domestic policy, politics and US foreign policy. So let's begin. Let's start at the beginning. Rob, I remember speaking with you back in 2016 on the Stanford campus about the great migration of students away from the humanities and toward tech. Wasn't a new trend at the time, but I know it speaks to the story of how this book and the course that started it came to be. So tell us about this. 
Yeah, great. Well, thanks so much for, for having us here. It's a real honor and a, a thrill to, to um, rejoin the Great Books community now to speak about this book uh, that has come out of the collaboration that I think reflects in certain respects the highest aspirations of a, a, a liberal education that uh, I know is core to the Great Books mission. Um, we three represent uh, three different disciplinary approaches. I'm the philosopher, Jeremy, the social scientist and policy expert, and Maron, the, the, the computer scientist. And just as you, you said, Katie, uh, this class that we teach began, um, it would ultimately spawn to this book, when um, uh, I noticed, and Jeremy as well as a social scientist noticed, that uh, people were migrating in record numbers in, un in undergraduates over to the engineering quad, uh, uh, in part because they had enlisted in this course taught by Maron, the Introduction to Computer Science class, which at Stanford is known as CS106A. Um, at this point uh, in time, it's the largest major on campus. Um, the small number of students who haven't taken CS106A have chosen not to do so almost as a deliberate act of rebellion against the, the kind of gravitational force of acquiring a technologic, technical um, skill set at Stanford. And I was curious to know partly what the secret sauce was over there on the engineering quad. And then because it was 2016, as you mentioned, Katie, that was the year that um, President Trump was elected, Cambridge Analytica, the scandal at Facebook that involved a leak of data um, that was then used in order to make uh, targeted advertisements and political um, um, electioneering uh, um, to interfere you know, in, in, in domestic elections. In other words, the kind of privacy abuses, the, the, the availability of misinformation and disinformation as well as the rise of automated machines that were displacing people from work. It didn't seem like the tech world, which had so transformed our lives, was all upside. Um, there was uh, this utopian belief that was part of Silicon Valley for so long about how the rise of the technologist would, would both um, unlock human potential and spread democracy around the world. And now in 2015 and 2016, as people were majoring in record numbers in computer science at Stanford, the downsides of big tech were becoming increasingly obvious. And uh, the initial idea was to try to bring together a class that would combine these three different perspectives, an ethical framework, a policy framework, and a technical framework in one class, a class in which students had to do technical assignments, policy memos, and philosophy papers. And uh, after the success of launching that class at Stanford, which we've just begun teaching for the fourth time, I put the, the website for the class um, up in the chat. Um, we decided about a little over a year ago to write a book together. And th that's the, the, the origin story of the, of the book. Fantastic, fantastic. So that, uh, yeah, I suppose I didn't think of our, our conversation, our summer 2016 seems so divorced from the election 2016 in my mind. So two separate, two separate eras. Um, funny when you said that, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought of those in a connected way, but um, certainly that was, yes, the, I don't know, the turning point of, you know, tech as savior to tech as destroyer, maybe um, in one take. So You've developed this class, your intent on um, helping, you know, young thinkers who are probably headed to Silicon Valley to look at things in a different way. Um, and you brought it to a book. What's the book about, Jeremy? So I'll start uh, in answering that question. Others may want to jump in. Um, I think at its core, the book is focused on the reality that new technologies as they're designed and rolled out into the world encode a set of values in them. And those are typically the values of those who design technologies, build technologies, finance them, or oversee them. But the reality is as new technologies are built, the values that are encoded in those technologies are often in tension with other values that we might care about. This is most directly on display when you think about something like um, privacy protecting technology. So think about something like end-to-end -end encrypted communication, where the value of privacy, our ability to shield the communications that we have with one another, um, 
is chosen over the value of, say, national security, the ability of the state or law enforcement to have visibility into those communications to protect us from, say, terrorism. We also see that in the context of new technologies, say artificial intelligence that displaces work, there the value of efficiency with respect to production uh, that may come from the use of automated technologies is in tension with our ability potentially to provide dignified and meaningful work opportunities for everyone in society. And so when you recognize that value tensions and trade-offs are at the core of every technological decision, then you have to grapple with the question, well, why do we find ourselves in a position in this day and age where while technology yields enormous benefits for us, we are in increasingly attentive to the social costs and consequences of new technologies that have largely been ignored or unaddressed. The displacement of work, the pollution of our information ecosystem, the reinforcement of bias and discrimination. And at the core of our book is an argument about the three systemic factors that give rise to that lack of attention and response to these social consequences of technology. The first part of the argument is a focus on how engineers are trained to think about the world, what we call the optimization mindset. The second part of the argument is about the role of venture capital, and in particular, how the way in which we finance technology increases the likelihood that new technologies are scaled in ways that affect all of us, including all of our collective interests long before we understand their consequences. And the third part of the argument is about the way in which our politicians have in effect tied their hands behind their back over the last two and a half decades, creating an oasis, a regulatory oasis in which technologists could largely act unencumbered by any constraints of the state. And so the book at its core is an argument that these problems that we see today are not just the problems of Mark Zuckerberg or the problems of Sergey Brin and Larry Page at Google, they are the result of systemic drivers that generate new technologies with social consequences that are largely unpredicted, unaddressed, and not responded to on the back end. Um, and so we want to identify those social harms and we want to identify those systemic drivers and then offer people a framework for thinking about how you address them. Katie, can I just hop in there to add one quick thing? Uh, Jeremy just mentioned this point, but I want to underscore it because I think it's so central and important to communicate about the aspiration of the book. Um, probably everyone's aware of the Elizabeth Holmes uh, trial, which just concluded last week with her conviction on four charges. She's the Stanford dropout who created this blood testing company called Theranos, and she was just convicted of having defrauded her investors, uh, misleading people about exactly the technology that she was alleging that she had created. Um, it's so easy in the media and in our own minds to fixate on the good technologists and the bad technologists. Oh, we hate Facebook because Mark Zuckerberg isn't you know, a grown up. Yet. He hasn't matured in a way to actually steward a platform with 4 billion people. But you know, either Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or whomever are, are better leaders. Our book is designed to try to wipe away that impression that we should somehow fix all the problems with tech by getting good people to run tech companies instead of bad people. And the, the title of the book, System Error, is chosen deliberately to reflect the fact that independent of who the people are, there are these systematic incentives for certain types of technological choices that in impart these values into the technologies that Jeremy was describing. And we want to sort of set aside the idea that tech and its effects on us are a product of good people and bad people, and instead light a path forward for all of us to have a say in shaping a technological future worth having. Can I ask, I'm gonna put Mehran in the hot seat in a moment to talk about how we start to, what do we do about the problems that, you know, that we've, that Jeremy has identified and we've named, but Rob, I would love it. I know the book starts with, you know, a pretty simple and I think just really wonderful day, way to illuminate that kind of good person, bad person in technology 
good yeah. app, bad app thinking. Can you share briefly that story of the um, the parking app? Yeah, I won't name him. I don't. I feel like that poor that poor young man uh, probably is going to live in a bit of infamy from this. But uh, it's a wonderful example, and I think a really useful one to wrap our arms around. Yep. Optimization. Good. Yeah. So uh, we've been we've been teaching this class for four or five years, and of course, lots of people come to Stanford as undergraduates, as young 18, 19, 20 year olds, thinking not just about acquiring technical skills, which they can do. Um, but even becoming founders of startup companies. And in fact, the whole ecosystem here at Stanford and in Silicon Valley um, makes that possible because the venture capitalists who fund tech companies are located you know, almost literally a stone's throw away from campus and come to campus a lot. So you know, uh, um, uh, uh, a few years ago, we encountered a student on campus who had created already as an undergraduate a company that's called Do Not Pay. And do not pay a rose out of his experience as a high school student who had acquired some coding skills already as a high school student. He lived in London, where um, he must have um, frequently driven himself around town or driven to school and often um, um, parked his car uh, without paying whatever the necessary parking ticket, uh, parking fees were. And so we got lots of tickets. So we created this online system where you could upload a version of your, the ticket that you've gotten, the parking ticket, and the automated system would spit back for you the grievance procedure that was optimized to get you out of paying the parking ticket. And he described this quite proudly as a way of you know, fighting against a system which imposed parking tickets on unsuspecting people and this was a chance to fight back against the power of uh, you know, the government or the state or the city. And uh, we just viewed this, and this is why the book begins with this, this episode, of a classic example of a, you know, a 19 year old or a 20 year old using these extraordinarily powerful technical skills to solve a very narrow problem that wasn't even clear it was worth solving in the first place. Because of course, parking tickets have some legitimate purposes. They fund the municipal services. They allow, they allow people when someone parks in front of their driveway to have the police come and fix a ticket. So it's a disincentive to break the law. Um, it sometimes controls congestion in cities with, with di uh, different mechanisms, certainly in London, that's true. And without any broader social understanding about why it is that parking tickets exist, he created this clever hack in order to get out of paying parking tickets and then found himself the object of obsession um, among some venture capitalists to build his company and bring it to the benefit of people more widely, benefit in scare quotes there. And so we contrast that kind of mentality with an older mentality in Silicon Valley and indeed at Stanford in which people wanted to use the technical skills that you could get, but then devote them for some civic purpose, devote, them, devote, devote themselves to acquiring technical skills to improve the capacity of citizens to do work together. And that's what seems to have sort of been lost in Silicon Valley over the past decade. The idea that technical skills can be devoted to our collective purposes, our, our, our public good, rather than as a, a pathway to make a whole bunch of money solving a problem that typically is the problem of a 21 year old um, dude who has a, you know, a, a, um, um, some stereotypical problems of a 21 year old. Nobody likes a parking ticket, but as a as a as a driveway owner, and I think you know the story goes on to talk about the implications for revenues for a town, aside from you know the sort of sheer mechanics of running a city, keeping the streets clean, all of those important things that uh, you know we as a as a community uh, expect and and don't spend a lot of thinking, just a lot of time thinking about. So. We've identified some problems. We have this really uh, interesting and sort of simple example of how optimizing for the self, maybe if I could call uh, that do not pay app and optimization for the self uh, can come to be. But what can we actually do about these, these kinds of problems? I'm putting Mayron in the hot seat for that one. 
Thanks, Katie. Uh, I think it's a, you know, interesting in terms of the way things are framed, because oftentimes what technology companies would want you to believe is that the only things you can do are the personal actions that you should take. And a lot of the tech economy, at least in consumer applications, is based on an attention economy. Right. When you're for those of you who are on social networks or, you know, if you're like my kids spending a bunch of time on YouTube, um, those systems are built to take your attention. They're built to make you spend more time on the platform, because the more time you spend on the platform, for example, the more ads that can be shown to you. Um, and that's how companies generate their revenues. And so at one side, the companies are saying, well, it's your choice whether or not you want to use the applications. And that's a lot of language that they use is this is about your freedom. It's about your choice if you want to use the application or not. While at the same time, they're building these systems to basically try to optimize the amount of time to make it very, very hard for you to actually give up these applications. Um, at the same time, there are things you can do as an individual. For example, when you're browsing the web, you can set the privacy settings in your browser to try to give out less information about you because a lot of times that's how these sites work is they get a lot of information about when you come to that site, tracking you not only on that site, but across sites. You can do things like use incognito mode on your browser so you don't leave as much of a digital trail or it's harder to actually tie your behavior across different sites together. Cookie preferences, and you've probably all seen the pop-ups now that come up on various websites asking you about, do you want to set your cookie preferences? But And all of these things put the onus on you as the individual to have to take action. And so there's a couple arguments that we make. One of them is that most people don't actually take any action, even though they care about some of these things at a personal level. It's something called the privacy paradox. You might really care about your privacy, but you don't actually bother to go in and change the preferences on your web browser, for example, or on your phone about the information you give out, even though you say you care about it. The other thing is the notion that you're, it's actually as an individual, you're inside a much larger system. And like, you know, Rob and Jeremy alluded to, part of the change that needs to happen is not just these individual choices. That's kind of what we've been beguiled to believe is the only action we have, but to think about how at a broader level, systematically things can be changed uh, through, for example, our democratic processes, right? The part of the, the reason of reading things like great books is informing yourself so that when you can vote, or to participate in whatever kind of mechanism the country you're in might have for participation, you can try to impact these systematic measures. And the, the analogy we like to use sometimes is the roadway system, which is that, you know, if we just told people the only when cars were invented, the only choice you have is to drive or not drive. And you know what, there's not really any restrictions around driving, you can do whatever you want people would die. And that's actually what happened in the early days of driving. So what did we do? We created a whole system of safety around driving. We created lanes. We created things like seat belts in cars. We've put speed bumps around school zones. We created a system that made driving safer for everyone. And that was done systematically. Now you still had an individual choice whether or not you wanted to drive, but if you did, you were doing it in a system of safety. And our analogy with the high tech world is right now we're kind of in a place where there aren't very many rules. So you have to basically just try to be safe yourself. And what we really need is a broader set of regulations and guidelines that actually make the system safer for everyone. So I'm going to jump to Jeremy on my next question, because I think you know, the point is well taken. If we need to develop this system of measures, right? We have the indiv individual actions we can do, and many of us rightly, you know, you're right, don't do it. We could, we could reset our privacy settings, or like me, I could decide my life is so boring. I'm sad for the soul who, who has to, you know, sift through my data. It, it might be good material to read before they go to sleep at night, um, but this is a task that isn't going to be done alone by our individual choices, right? So Jeremy is two questions really, and you can you know discuss them together or pick them apart and anyone can jump in. Is this an American problem, a bigger geopolitical problem? And you know, if and here is is democracy up to the task of regulating technology? Thanks for the softballs, Katie. Um... I mean, th these are these are two of the biggest questions that we confront in in making sense of what to do about the present dilemma. So let me start with your second question first about democracy. So in a 
in a great books community thinking about the kind of philosophical and, and historical origins of democracy um, is familiar to you, I imagine, from some of the reading that you've done. Part of our enterprise in teaching young technologists and in writing this book is to help people more broadly appreciate this technology that we call democracy. So what is democracy a technology for? Well, it's a technology for helping people who live in societies that are full of diverse viewpoints and perspectives make decisions collectively about how we navigate our disagreements. It is not a perfect technology. It is not an optimizing technology, but it's the best technology that we've come up with over thousands of years to enable people to have a voice in the kind of society that they wanna live in. And we can all read the newspaper or our social media feeds or watch the television and see the challenges of democracy in this day and age, whether it's in Washington or around the world. But when you critique democracy, it's also important to think about the alternative. And the alternative, when people are making the argument that democracy isn't up to the task, let's be clear about what they are arguing for, which is continuing to rely on a set of empowered technologists and the investors that fund technology companies to make decisions that have given us a set of social harms, like the dislocation of labor, the lack of protections for workers in the gig economy, the pollution of our information ecosystem, the abuse of privacy that we increasingly see collectively as unacceptable. So is democracy up to the game? Well, it's hard to, to know yet because we haven't truly put democracy to work, but can we count on our existing approach, which is democracy being out of the game to get us better outcomes? I would count myself as skeptical. And so what that really demands is that we think hard about what it means to have a mobilized and educated citizenry paying attention to issues of tech regulation. These have not been at the forefront of people's minds, even though these have existential consequences for society. It means thinking hard about how we empower our politicians and our sort of technical bureaucrats with the, the know-how that they need, the exposure to technology, and how it works. And it means thinking about building governance architectures uh, in our political system that are far more responsive on a much quicker basis to the pace at which technology is changing. We can get into the detail of each of those elements and inform citizenry, politicians with the technical know-how and a more adaptive and responsive regulatory system. But those are the core elements, I think, of a democracy uh, that works and that can help us make progress on these issues. With respect to geopolitics, uh, let me say the following. We are at a moment of tremendous geopolitical tension. For those of us who grew up in the Cold War, it's reminiscent of a prior period where agreement on directions internationally was really difficult to achieve because of two polar powers that saw the world through different lenses, the USSR and the United States. We increasingly find ourselves at a similar moment of bipolarity in the international system. A powerful China and a powerful United States with its Western allies with very different and competing views about the kind of world uh, that, that these countries wanna see going forward. And so ultimately in that kind of moment, the challenge of arriving at a shared view of the relationship between the state and technology companies is on display. So while China might be implementing regulations that protect people's privacy, that's all about empowering the Chinese state over powerful competitors to the Chinese state, large technology companies in China. Whereas European Union's protection for privacy is all about protecting individual human rights and civil liberties vis-a-vis -vis the state. And so we're at a moment of different objective functions, different motivations. And so where I come down on these questions is, not to look at geopolitical competition as a reason for avoiding tech regulation. That's what you might hear from the technologists in Silicon Valley who say, we confront competition with China and thus we shouldn't do anything to constrain our innovation potential because China won't be constraining innovation potential. I look at it in an entirely different way, which, I, which is I say to compete with China globally, to effectively navigate for the United States, 
this moment that we're in internationally, and of course, some of your audience is also international, to end up with a global system that is pacific and cooperative rather than one that generates conflict. We're gonna to need to address these social consequences of technology and the place to do that begins with our own domestic polities, right? That, that the progress that we're gonna make internationally is gonna follow our ability in the European Union, in the United States, in Australia, in other places in the world to think about how we balance technology's benefits and harms. And then we can begin to think about international cooperation. But until we make progress in our own democracy in the United States, in the European Union and other places, it's very hard to think how, about how you're gonna arrive at international agreements and standards going forward. So as we think about this, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm always reminded or of, you know, a, a phrase that I've heard a few times in these kinds of conversations, you know, where we talk about Americans as innovators and, you know, the Europe, Europeans as those who are, you know, at the forefront of privacy and protection and, you know, sort of legislating and things coming across that way. I am, you know, and in, in your you know, we've talked about the things that we can do individually as consumers, but certainly before government gets involved and simultaneous to any legislation and consideration of legislation that will really move the ball forward, I think in a meaningful way immediately, um, let's bring it back to the technologists and talk a little bit about how we get, you know, those technologists, those folks who are creating the algorithms to consider the consequences of what they're creating, you know, a few steps out further. Um, and to be able to do that, you know, with all of the challenges of speedy innovation. Um, I'll say Maron maybe weigh in on that. And then I would love a dose of Rob Reich on that as well. Well, it's a great question. And part of it's, you know, the drivers for what causes the sort of behavior we see. Um, a lot of the drivers are, as we referred to early on in the book around the optimization mindset is trying to find particular things. What computer scientists and what engineers try to do in general is they try to improve things and to improve something, you need a measurement to, that you want to increase or decrease whatever you're trying to do. Um, so, for example, what an engineer might want to do if they're working at Facebook, right, Facebook's stated mission is to connect the world. Well, connecting the world isn't something you can measure directly unless you create a proxy for that that says, what's my notion of how I connect the world? Well, their notion of how they connect the world is how many people are on the Facebook platform, how many friendship links there are, how much time people spend on the platform. So they have algorithms that are learning patterns of people's behavior to show them content that helps to optimize those metrics, right? You get suggestions for people who might be your friends. You get suggestions for content that you should read to try to keep you on the site, because those are the things that those increase those metrics. That's how someone gets rewarded in the company. But you can see the problem there. There's a clear difference between the notion of actually connecting the world and having people feel better about their connections and just giving them pieces of content that they're more likely to click on. People are more likely to click on content that angers them or infuriates them or makes them feel a particular emotion. That doesn't necessarily mean they feel connected to other people. It just means that their emotions are being used as a way to keep them on the platform. So part of the technology, what the technologists need to realize, and at a broader level, what the companies need to think about is what are the things they're optimizing and what are the value trade-offs that they're actually making when they choose to optimize one thing over another? You could think that that metric could actually be changed, that rather than the time spent on platform, you could, for example, be showing people pieces of content that make them, if you want to survey your users or get other information, actually make them feel better about being on the platform. Is that possible to do? Well, that hasn't been tested. Why hasn't it been tested? Because it's not something that currently is a decision the companies have made. So that's what we need to realize is that the technology itself is in service to what some set of human beings, the executives of these companies, say is important to optimize. And then we get these externalities that occur in the world, like political polarization and bullying online, whatever the case may be, as a result of those metrics being optimized. We need to change the metrics if we want to change the outcomes. I'll hop in there to add as well, Katie, that the 
you know, the thing that I'm inclined to respond to that question about, so it, it, we're likely going to have to wait a little while for public policy and regulation to catch up to where the technology um, is at the moment. And so we have to look as a consequence also to the professional norms, the, the sort of um, responsibilities that anybody who's a programmer or a technologist takes upon their own shoulders um, in order to help steer us to a better future. And you know what I'd say for any anyone listening, whether or not you're you know a parent or a student, if you if you go to the doctor, um, you're fully aware that there are a set of professional norms that organize the the medical profession and the research in a biomedical sense. Like if you tinker in your garage with your chemistry set and invent a new you know treatment for COVID. You can't just show up at the pharmacy and start selling it um, next week because you decided you have something to give it a try with. Um, in fact, if you are guilty of malpractice as a healthcare provider, you can be um, de-licensed or lose your permission to practice medicine. Um, there's the Federal Drug Administration in the United States that's you know a, a very detailed and cumbersome way to bring any new experimental medication to market. And there's really no equivalent of these kinds of professional norms in computer science. And I don't say that as a way of saying, you know, something that's meant to be um, deeply skeptical of computer science. The fact of the matter is that computer science is a much younger field. Um, it really only came into existence about 70 years ago, and computer scientists have only acquired the kinds of powers they have in the world through technology companies in the past 20 years. It took a whole century for um, medicine to develop the kinds of professional norms and standards it has today. Hopefully we can do better than that in computer science. It won't take a century because we, the pace of technological innovation is going to require, just as you framed the question, Katie, the adoption of some professional responsibilities in a, in a certainly an accelerated fashion in order that we can avoid um, the negative outcomes that we see all around us. And just to give you a concrete example of this, you can find these days all kinds of companies that have facial recognition tools or you know, services in which you deploy facial recognition for various purposes. Facial recognition has all kinds of good, good potential purposes. If you have a, you know, an, an, an iPhone, you probably have one that opens the system, unlocks the phone on the basis of recognizing your face. Um, uh, however, facial recognition also has a bunch of negative purposes. So you can use facial recognition in the way that computer scientists and some companies have in order to try to make predictions about whether the people around you um, are likely to be high spenders or low spenders in a shopping mall, are likely to be gay or straight in a, in a dating context. Um, you can even find facial recognition research that tries to connect the features of your face and whether or not you're likely or not to commit a crime. These are not especially welcome, um, in my view, use cases of facial recognition and actually introduce all kinds of older notions of forms of scientific racism. Uh, so um, at the moment, there's no professional price that a company or an individual pays for trying to use an algorithmic model like uh, facial recognition to predict criminal tendencies in the way that there would be a price to be paid if someone in medicine tried to suggest something similar about you know, showing up in the doctor's office and making a whole set of assumptions about someone on the basis of their race or their sexual orientation or whatever it turned out to be. That's the sense in which the developmental immaturity of computer science um, puts us all at a collective disadvantage and the sense in we need to accelerate the development of professionalism within computer science is something that we try to champion through our teaching and through other efforts here at the university. Thank you. Big, I'm feeling the shortness of the, the brevity of this hour we have together as I look at the clock and see that I need to jump to questions raised by our audience. Um, I feel like there's another hour of this, this very typical Great Books conversation. Um, and very, very big, deep topics. So let me jump to some of the questions that were added to our Q&A. And if you have questions still, there's still time to get yours in there. Please go to the Q&A um, menu option, typically shown at the bottom of the screen and type your question there. And I will just pick, 
I think on that, uh, we, you know, we were discussing about discussing there's this problem. There are these paths to fix it. Uh, none of them are, I think, are, are set fully in motion yet. And someone is asking, realistically, how fast could this problem uh, be fixed? And, and added to it, is it, is it election dependent? So I'm going to swing this to you and uh, to Jeremy. I should expect as the social scientist and policy guy to get all the hard politics questions. Um, so now this is a little bit like being a talking head on, on uh, a political news show. Um, this is not going to be fixed in one piece of legislation. It's not going to be fixed in one election cycle. I think the right way to understand the moment that we're at is the opening of a policy window that I expect to be a decade long, if not longer, and to involve a sequence of efforts to legislate both in Europe, which is far ahead of the game, probably five years ahead of the United States in terms of its orientation toward privacy or algorithmic accountability or issues of competition in the social media and digital space. You've got California leading the way in the United States because nothing's been happening, happening out of Washington. California passes its own privacy law a couple of years ago. Now we've got a slew of bills under consideration um, in Congress uh, obviously the challenges of the moment with respect to getting any bipartisan legislation through, but one of the striking things is that both Democrats and Republicans are concerned about the amount of power vested in a small number of technology companies, so concerns about um, uh, antitrust uh, are something that's shared on both sides of the aisle. You also have China beginning to regulate, uh, again, for different reasons, as I described earlier. What we've seen historically is that regulation often comes in a single wave. You've got the accumulation of problems over time. And then finally, Washington DC, at least in the United States, wakes up and has one big piece of legislation to fix the problems that were present. But I think one of the real challenges that we have with developments in technology is that there's not one problem here. There are lots of different problems. There are lots of different value trade-offs. And so in addition to addressing each of these harms, privacy abuses, misinformation, the displacement of labor, we also need a government that's better able to act quickly to identify harms and address them as they come up. And so we're gonna need reforms on that front as well in the United States and elsewhere around the world. So I expect that this is a moment where you buckle your seatbelt. There are gonna be ups and downs. Elections may provide setbacks. We'll continue to have, if you're thinking from the American context, polarization. Macron, you know, today was all about in the press uh, dealing with misinformation and the challenges of the social media platforms. You've seen Australia play a leadership role on this front as well. This is gonna be a wild ride over the next 10, 15 years. Um, and it's why we really need people thinking at these intersections and beginning to exercise their voice. Can I add one more thing there, Katie, because I, I'm cognizant of the fact that we have, a, you know, an audience, um, partly of people who are, you know, teenagers. And, um, you know, you said at the start, Katie, that, oh, my gosh, thinking back to 2016, 2016 is, you know, five and a half, uh, six years ago at the most. Um, and it already seems like such a, you know, um, an era that's long lost, um, uh, you know, possibly a slightly more innocent era in which we weren't aware of all these problems of big tech and the kinds of um, consequences of climate change and populism and all the other, you know, problems that we're familiar with today across the globe. And what I want to, what I want to emphasize here to any of the young people is that there's, you know, there's a familiar saying that I think young people don't hear often enough, which is that we always overestimate the change that's possible in a single year's time. Um, it's very hard to bring about massive change in just 12 months, but we also often underestimate the change that's possible in a decade. And so when Jeremy just gave us the relevant time horizon here, not what will Congress do later this year, but what will we be able to carry out in the next decade or 15 years? Um, that's the relevent time horizon. So the, the people who are 15 years old or 12 years old in the, in the audience right now, in a decade, you'll be 22 or 25, just starting your careers. 
And the, the amount of work that you personally and your generation can contribute here is extraordinary. And your voice is needed more than ever before. And you should never underestimate the potential to carry out significant change. And in fact, of course, here's what the old person is always likely to say. If we look back over the course of history, the kind of you know, most important social changes have often been led by young people. And that's going to be the audience that's listening to this call. So this is a challenge for your generation and you should step into it with all of your voice and your agency. Wonderful advice, wonderful advice. I have a few questions that I'm going to combine into one um, because they're related and they really are focused on, you know, the internet was supposed to bring this great democratization of ideas allow for freedom of expression, even in authoritarian areas. Instead, the openness has been abused and maybe weaponized with misinformation and propaganda, with no curation, accountability, or even common recognition of validity or accuracy. How can society defend itself against the dilution of trustworthiness? And on a related note, um, you know, and maybe some would call some of that an abuse of, how do we avoid abuses of censorship? Um, you know, given that many of us fear if governments enact rules and regulations over technology, then perhaps technology becomes political. So I've kind of wrapped up three questions into one and um, I could hit Jeremy with that again, but I'm gonna hit Mehran with that. You should give that. that one to Mehran for sure. I am, I am. Well, I'll channel a little technologist, then I'll channel my inner Jeremy, because I think everyone should have an inner Jeremy and an inner Rob. Um, in terms of thinking about misinformation, the spread of information, and weighing that against freedom of speech, one of our colleagues at Stanford, Rene DeResta, has the saying that, that we really like, which is that freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom of reach. The ability to say something does not also guarantee the ability for you to be able to broadcast it as widely as possible or have technology enable that. And so in some of the ways the technology has been used and weaponized to be able to take misinformation and spread it widely, there's no reason why that technology couldn't also be used to limit the spread of information, to slow it down until it can be verified or until it can be found to be false, in which case it can be pulled out of the system or labeled as such. Part of the problem is that we have a system in place right now that benefits from distributing that information as widely as possible and, in fact, targeting it to particular individuals if it causes them to engage more on the platform. What we really need are a sense of thing of sensible reforms where we think about the fact that when a piece of information is posted, maybe there needs to be some more uh, analysis of its veracity before it's allowed to spread to millions of other people. Some platforms actually do this. For example, they limit the amount of time something can be the equivalent of, say, retweeted or replaced on the platform before it, it has to be reviewed by a human being. And so there's ways, I mean, these are not kinds of things that are intrinsic to the platforms or intrinsic to the technology. They're choices that people have made. And if we want to have different choices, either we have to believe that the people in the companies themselves are going to make the choices, which we haven't really seen a track record of very much, or we as a society need to have particular regulations that say these are the kinds of things we want to see in those platforms because the value of the veracity of information is more important to us than just the ability to spread that information as widely as possible. Great, I'm going to do just two more questions. Gosh, I wish we had more time. Um, but let me just circle back again to um, what can we as individuals do to influence the behavior of big tech? And maybe, maybe remembering that we're speaking to some you know, some future engineers here, some future technologists, or perhaps that uh, everyone's future uh, who's younger than me probably revolves around a fair amount of technology in their, in their working life. Um, I'm going to bat that one over to Jeremy because my next question is for Rob. So uh, let me offer the following thoughts, which is let me start with what you shouldn't do. What you shouldn't do is listen to the problems that we've described 
and say to yourself, technology is broken and thus I should have nothing to do with it. I should go off the grid. I should never work for a technology company. Um, I need to abandon this future that we are already living in and that is likely to evolve. That is absolutely not our message. And it's a conversation that we have on a regular basis with young technologists uh, at Stanford. I think instead, you know, the, the impetus behind our book and the urgency with which we speak is to say that there are really consequential roles that all of us are playing in how this set of tensions and contestation plays out. We need technologists who see their future in the tech industry, who are deeply attuned to the value trade-offs that new technology poses for all of us, and who are attentive to the power that's invested in the hands of those who build technology and roll it out for the world. And so abandoning tech companies isn't the solution. Flooding tech companies with people who are attentive to these, these societal consequences, that's part of the solution. It's part of building this culture and ethic of responsibility in tech. It also means if you see yourself being in leadership roles in business or leadership roles as an investor, that you don't accept the proposition that if I don't do this, you know, even if it's bad, someone else will just do it so I can go ahead, which is a common argument that we hear from investors or, or corporate elites. But instead, you see yourself as a participant in a society and an economy where there are multiple stakeholders. Um, but then most importantly, whether you're an engineer or not, or a business leader or not, everyone's a citizen. And while you can do things in your private life to help you navigate these social consequences for yourself and for your family, the most important thing you can do is exercise your political muscles. Um, and exercising your political muscles means developing a view on these complex policy issues around antitrust, around Section 230, the regulation of speech, uh, so on and so forth. And then beginning to, to mobilize others to develop their own views and to convey your views to your elected officials. Because that 3,000 year old technology that we have that's called democracy, that's the best tool we have in our toolkit to address these social dilemmas. Fantastic, fantastic. Oh, I'm so pained. I'm just doing one last question. And I'm sending this one to you, Rob, because. Um, I'm, I already love the answer that you're going to give. And as a, as a parent, as a great books administrator, um, and you know, just as someone who works with youth all the time, you're gonna have some great advice here. The question is, hi, I am a Chinese high school student. How do you think technology slash engineering major is connected with humanities? I'm interested in CS and history, but do not know what to choose. Great question, and it gives me another chance to speak directly to all the young people on the call. Um, the, the simple answer, as you probably would predict from our collaboration, is that you should do both. Um, technology without an understanding of ethics and policy and history is likely to produce all kinds of problems. And in fact, in certain respects, that's part of the diagnosis we make of the problem in Silicon Valley. The idea that venture capital firms swoop down onto campus in order to try to fund the idea of 19 year olds who haven't really lived a lot in the world and don't understand anything about history um, necessarily um, it is a recipe for the do not pays to get the, the traction that they get. Let, let's solve the problem of the 19 year old high school student who's annoyed about paying parking tickets. And then let's scale that to many people, as many people as we can. By contrast, one of the most important lessons here that the humanities and the great books can teach us is that while the technology and the science is always progressing, the basic framework of some of these problems is one that repeats itself over and over again, always with some new form or fashion. But the, the, the kind of tensions between democratic institutions and then frontier technologies is an old one. You've, you've got in the back of you right there, Katie, an old phonograph, which at one point was a novel technology that was bringing recorded music um, rather than live music to the world in which people worried about, oh my gosh, Live musicians would be displaced from their work. Um, would recorded music ever be as good as or powerful as live music? And 
Eventually, there came to be ways to understand how it is that this technology fit into our world, and ultimately then even ways to regulate it um, in order to protect intellectual property, in order to allow for innovation to continue to happen. That's the same thing that's going to happen now. And so for the person who says, should I do history or should I do tech a technical field, get some of both, because that will actually equip you to be amongst the most informed and most powerful people of your generation. Um, have all of the tools of the humanities and social sciences and technology and science at your disposal. Get yourself a liberal education, um, and that's how you can make significant progress in, in the new generation. Good advice, good advice. Thank you once again. I'm so sorry I couldn't get to everyone's questions. Thank you to all for joining us. I think my book, my, my camera is mirrored, but get your copy of the book. It's available from HarperCollins. Find your local bookseller. Always a plug for the local bookstores out there or wherever you buy your books. The book is System Error, Error, Where Big Tech Went Wrong and How We Can Reboot, available again through HarperCollins. And read, inform yourself, and keep, most importantly, keep the conversations going. I know we raised lots of different ideas here and lots of different ways that we can look at this issue and steps we can take to move forward in our own lives and as a larger community, country, world. Um, keep the conversations going in the true style of great books. This is where we, this is where the magic happens. You agree, you disagree, you discuss, and that is how things move and change and move forward in the world. So thank you again for coming. Thank you, Dr. Miran Sahami, Dr. Jeremy Weinstein, Dr. Rob Reich. Such a wonderful evening and really hope to see you all soon, perhaps at the Stanford campus or some other great books event in the future. Thank you again. Thanks, Have everybody. a good night, everybody. Thank you, and thank you. If anyone has questions about upcoming great books classes or programs happening, feel free to stick around. Paula and I will stay here and be very happy to take any of your questions. You can post them in the chat. Um, but again, thanks to all. Have a wonderful evening, or if you're on the other side of the world, have a great morning and afternoon, and hope to see you at Great Books again soon. Bye-bye, everyone.